Can you make boring things fun? You know, the boring things that you know will make your life better in the long run, but they kind of suck in the short term? Could you make cleaning the whole house feel like riding a jet ski? Could you make working out feel like Dungeons and Dragons? And could paperwork ever feel as exciting as Jenga? That's the dream of gamification. But like so many dreams, the reality is just not that simple. Because yes, you can gamify education, but you could also gamify a scam. So what do you do? When tools that could change your life could also be used against you. Gamification. How do you play without getting played? Huge thanks to Canva for sponsoring this, more on them in a bit. In this video, we're gonna cover a lot. Stories ranging from Diogenes to zombies to Sam Bankman Freed. What MLMs and Pokemon have in common, and how Tinder uses a Mario Kart tactic to profit off loneliness. It's a big video, and it took a while to put together, so get comfy and enjoy the ride. Let's start with the definition. Gamification. Yes, it's using game mechanics and elements in non-gaming environments. Objectives, rules, points, feedback, leaderboards, that sort of stuff, using it outside of a game. Assigning a progress bar to a project, or points to push-ups. Basically taking the fun, engaging parts of games and putting them on the not so fun and not so engaging parts of life. And while the term gamification is relatively new, the concept itself is not. Actually, my favorite example of gamification comes from 1903. Remember that year? Me neither. It's the early 1900s. Our main character is Elizabeth McGee. She's in the US and around her she starts noticing something. Alarming amounts of wealth disparity. Old Lizzie is living in the golden age of the Baron. And also child labour. But she doesn't want this, so she decides to do something about it. She decides to educate people. She gives herself this task. Get people to engage in conversations about the dangers of wealth gaps on society with regards to Georgian economics, property ownership, and alternative taxation structures. And just because Lizzie loved to challenge, she decided that she would also teach all of this to children as well. So she's got this dry, dense subject that she wants to teach to a non-captive audience. Which means she needs something really effective. Not a lecture, not a pamphlet, no. Elizabeth makes a game. The Landlord's Game. In the game, players would simulate what it was like to be tenants and landlords. But, unlike most games, Lizzie didn't just have one set of rules. She had two. Two different ways to play the same board game. The first way was in landlord mode, and the second way was in prosperity mode. When they were playing the landlord version, the aim of the game was to get as much stuff as possible. You had to get all of the money and leave everybody else bankrupt. That is how you won. But when they played in prosperity mode, it was under a different set of economic guidelines. And these didn't facilitate those wealth gaps. Which is great, because to win prosperity mode, you had to win as a team. The game was won when every player had at least doubled the money that they started with. This is what Elizabeth McGee called achieving prosperity. Of course, we all know what happens next. Even if you don't know what happens next, you probably know what happens next. What is your name, please? My name is Charles B. Darrow. I am the man who created the game Monopoly. <laughs> yeah, Monopoly. That's where this one goes. Charles Darrow decides to play the Landlord's game in real life, and he sells a near-identical version of this game to Parker Brothers. Only his game didn't have prosperity mode. It only had the first one. The one where you had to win and everybody else had to lose. The one where you had to have a monopoly. There's the same story off the board. For someone to win, someone else had to lose. Charles Darrow went on to become the world's first millionaire board game designer, and Lizzie McGee and her dreams of prosperity were lost. Well, she's not lost anymore, which is good. And neither's the irony, for that matter that the tool that was made to warn people about the dangers of monopolies got co-opted to create a monopoly. Right. But Lizzie's soul is still in the game because monopoly does make people angry. Like significantly angry. Not at real world economic injustices like she intended, just at each other. Now, uh, you ready for one final irony? Last year, Hasbro decided that maybe monopoly was a teaching tool after all. But not to teach kids to get mad at economic injustice, to teach them to accept it. Don't like monopolies? Calm down, let go, and learn to cope with losing. Games as tools, they're clearly a force to be reckoned with. But so is greed.
And if we zoom out, this idea of a tool falling into the wrong hands, it's kind of how I see the story of gamification itself. Because in essence, we're working with our existing nature to create behavioral change, but this can just so easily be manipulated. For example, a lot of people like the feeling of advancing levels, which might make Super Mario fun, it could make a math game fun, or it could make Scientology fun. It's the same technique that our brain loves, but with very different results. To describe this, I've come up with a metaphor with the worst name ever. I call it Schrodinger's Catch. Eh? You're playing a game of catch. It's a fun game, but you don't quite know what you're catching. It could be a tennis ball, but it could also be a grenade. One of them is fun, the other one you explode. Mechanically, these are both games, but until the thing is in your hand, you don't know whether this game is fun or deadly. The throwing represents the gamification element, like points, prizes, leaderboards, and the thing that gets thrown is how that element is brought to life. So we got tennis ball and grenades, good gamification and bad gamification. The moral value isn't from gamification, but the way it is executed. Some good examples include Duolingo. There are so many ways that you can learn a language, and yet Duolingo has pretty much risen to the top. Apparently now Duolingo is teaching more people how to speak other languages than the US school system. Wild, man. And a crucial part of its absolutely turbocharged success is games. Another cool example is Habitica. It's an RPG for self-improvement. So you got your avatar, and as you improve, you put your stats in, and you watch them improve. And because we all love lists of three, let's uh, include Zombies Run. As somebody who loves running, let me be the first to say, running is super boring. Now, sometimes I enjoy that boredom, but understandably, a lot of people don't. They find it very unengaging, unexciting, like, oh god, so what, I'm just gonna run? Zombies Run bypasses this by simulating a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, so as you're running, you'll hear the freaking zombies be like, ah, brains, brains, we're gonna get you, we're gonna get you. And then you keep running while you're cognitively engaged, or because we've got this cool fantasy narrative that is accompanying the thing that we actually wanted to do, but we were putting off because it's kind of boring. Gamification can be good, it can be a tennis ball, but let's do a list of three for the grenades. Bad examples of gamification. Start with The Game. Yeah, you know that book by Neil Strauss? About a subculture of pickup artists using game mechanics to sleep with people. Ugh. Second example, market manipulation. We're listening to Go On Infinite by Michael Lewis at the moment, and the way that Sam Bankman Freed describes crypto and financial markets is incessantly as a game. For what him might be gamification is somebody else's like entire financial future just gone. And then the third example is one that's a bit more murky. Club Penguin. Bunch of kids playing as penguins, and these penguin children, they are earning points in-game currency that can, yes it can, be spent at the Club Penguin store. You can get a bunch of cool stuff, except for one tiny detail. Your in-game currency requires actual currency to be spent. Yup, you gotta go ask mum and dad for six bucks a month in order to spend your Club Penguin coins. I've never played it, I'm sorry. Here the kid thinks it's a tennis ball, but you know, the mum's wallet gets tossed a grenade. And that is Schrodinger's catch. Did that metaphor make sense? Because it did in my head. If it didn't, the point that I'm trying to make is this. While we are using gamification in our lives to make our lives better, it's also very, very good that we stay aware that other people are using gamification to make their lives better at the expense of our own life. Yes, yeah, sometimes we are not the player, but the played. Take the concept of inertia. When games get you to play to the end. A simple example is pool. You play until the eight ball sinks. A not so good example would be Monopoly, where you play until you have a fight. Outside of the world of games, you see this inertia tactic a lot in like sign up pages, you know, when you're signing up to something and it's like you've almost finished your profile, you're at 80%. Get to 100, do it, give us your data. A really evil example of inertia being used is MLMs, multi-level marketing, yeah. They try to keep people playing the game of being in the MLM for as long as possible by promising a big payday just around the corner. If you can just do this, 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 and this, you'll be a millionaire, you'll be your own boss. It's so freaking predatory and I hate it. How would you like to make more money in a month than the average American makes in an entire year? Sound impossible? It's not. We're doing it. A lot of people are doing it. And so can you. Because now it's your turn. Inertia here is being used as a manipulation tactic. Keep playing and eventually you'll win. And that means money and lots of it. Of course, inertia can be good too. Inertia can be the thing that keeps you gripped in a mystery book or gets you to the end of a marathon. My favourite example of inertia is Who's That Pokemon? They give you the guessing game just before an ad break to make sure you stuck around. And on that note, Who's that Pokemon? 
If you're looking for a shortcut with creativity or graphic design, then this is hopefully a very relevant sponsor. Canva, they've recently launched something called Magic Studio. And in the simplest terms possible, it's Canva meets AI. What does this mean for you? Basically, if you're using it and you have an idea, Magic Studio will make it possible. I make videos and using Magic Design for video, I can turn this into this. If you've ever had a great idea, but then struggled with a presentation, Magic Design for presentations allows you to just describe what you want. Then it makes it and then you can tweak it to your liking. That's a lot of time that you just get back. My philosophy is focus on the thing that you actually love and the thing that makes a difference and then try to free up the, uh, the rest. Yeah, and that's what Magic Studio does. Another really cool feature in Magic Studio is Magic Media. Type in what you want and literally it makes it. I think this is wild. But yeah, Canva has always been one of those useful tools, but now it's sort of gotten to that level where it's like cheat code shortcut useful tool. And personally, my appetite to create stuff is usually higher than my actual ability to, but it's stuff like this that starts to bridge that gap. Canva.me slash struthless45. Get the discount. If you're interested, check it out. All right, let's keep talking games. It's Pikachu! Pikachu! Before the Pokemon, we looked at inertia. The thing that motivates you to get to the end of the game. But if you're not doing great at that game, you're probably not going to be that motivated to finish it. Here is where a game designer might use a different tactic. The catch-up feature. I stopped playing video games at Nintendo 64, so that is also where my references stop. But in Mario Kart 64, when you're in last place, when you come in eight, that's where you get all the sweet items. You get the lightning bolt, you get the star, you get all the stuff that can actually help you catch up. When you're in first, none of that. Actually, one of the designers of Magic the Gathering cites the catch-up feature as one of the most important elements of Magic. Because while some players are just gonna be better than others, the tension that bad could win is what keeps people coming back. Now, this is so easy to manipulate because it's hope, it's optimism. And the grenade example that I would like to use comes from loneliness. Oh yeah, man, Tinder. Tinder, the dating app. Their catch-up feature comes in the form of a super like, a like that you can pay for so you can get the attention of other people, the people that you are trying to date. Now, I think that this is pretty predatory because what you're doing is you've got a customer who feels like they are falling behind or they're excluded from the dating game, and then Tinder sees this loneliness and capitalizes on it by saying, hey, don't worry, you can catch up if you pay. It's kind of like those old arcade games. When you lose, they give you the option to pay to keep playing. But a catch-up feature, it's just one gamification element. If you're Tinder and you're really looking to cash in on your customer's sadness, why stop at just one? Because the more Tinder acts like an arcade game, the more coins Tinder's gonna get. How to profit off gamified loneliness in three easy steps. Firstly, cover the bases. You wanna make your super like valuable. Your customers, you've already got them in that pay to play level structure, so just simply reinforce this ranking. This item is for VIPs. Make it feel different. Different badge, different color, and pair it with a brand new physical movement. We're not swiping left and right, we're swiping up. Novelty. Next, you wanna dial up that sense of competition, but also the sense that you could win. This is a catch up feature after all. However, it's important that this all still feels very much chance based. We need that variable reward mechanic if we wanna get people truly addicted. Then finally, to really make it a game, add a little strategy. Issue five super likes a day. Let your users know that this is a finite resource that needs to be managed and deployed strategically, given limited information. You want them to really feel that sense of the stock depleting and then replenishing, and on a time-based mechanic so they can't control it. This means if they do want to control it, they just got to buy it. And if they don't, just limit the supply. Once your customers have felt the benefits of the super like, reduce the amount you give them from five a day down to five a week. Now that stock is scarce, but you know they want it, they'll be running out a lot more. And you know what? Why stop there with the game elements? This is where you go full circle. You once again hit them with a catch up feature. Don't lose Hannah, refill now. Then bring it home with time pressure, loss aversion, and the possibility that the emotional hole that got them here in the first place might be filled in one little click. And 40 bucks. To you. And that's gamification. And we all know this story is way bigger than Tinder. As the global game market explodes, it's pretty natural that a lot of non-gaming companies would study it for clues. How do I make money like them? Maybe they'd see the pay to win phenomenon, a mechanic that in 2018 generated that industry over $30 billion. Like loot boxes that surprise players with items that you'd need to pay to unlock. Unsurprisingly, loot boxes have been repeatedly linked to problem gambling and also to EA, 
In 2018, EA came under fire for implementing this particular mechanic, this predatory loot box mechanic, into Star Wars Battlefront 2. Basically, they dressed up gambling as Star Wars, but people cottoned on, and as a result, their stock tanked. Now, new regulations around this were established the next year, but if revenue of these mechanics is anything to go by, it's not like the problem's solved. Meanwhile, outside of games, predatory gamification was just warming up. In online shopping, you've got Timu using a tactic that might look familiar. Social media has plenty of parallels. Badges, points, levels, competition, strategy, streaks, variable rewards, and also links to addiction. And then there's FinTech. Robin Hood made headlines in 2021 with the GameStop saga, which, as you can imagine, brought in a lot of young new users. And after GameStop, the games did not stop. The gamification, that is. Scoring points, badges, and confetti celebrations are just some of the elements within Robin Hood's app that have landed them with accusations of predatory gamification. Now, it is murky. I mean, is it really worth getting worked up over confetti? What's less murky is the vulnerability of the user base. 40% of them are first-time investors, more than half are in their 20s or younger, and 70% have a below average credit score. On one hand, this is cool, it's the story of accessibility. And I'd say that Robin Hood met this responsibly if their average user didn't make 6.2% lower returns than the S&P 500. Robin Hood the dude took from the rich to give to the poor, but Robin Hood the app? They're kind of taking from the poor to make themselves rich. Recently, they did have their license revoked in the state of Massachusetts, but if loot box regulation is anything to go by, it all just feels like a drop in the ocean. And this kind of, I don't know, it sort of confused me the more that I researched about this because gamification, when I first heard about it, called like 10 years ago or something, it was pitched to the world as like this revolutionary tool for behavioral change. And in many examples, it was. Two things for sure, that we can make any future we can imagine and we can play any games we want. So I say, let the world changing games begin. Thank you. But looking back at that era, I do think that the signs were there. You know what I mean? Check out this talk. Check out this talk. This is wild. And oh, now I'm going to make a side, a side note. I'm going to address it to someone personally, which is a little strange to do. So Brian Reynolds, I'm just going to say this. Hey, Brian. Brian, if you guys do not make a Farmville slot machine, where every time you win, you get cash money, and every time you lose, you get virtual money, then you are stupid. Because that would make you the richest person in the world. If you didn't catch that, he's telling Farmville's chief game designer to get in on the lucrative world of in-game gambling. And it all seems tongue in cheek, until you learn that less than a month later, Farmville's parent company, Zynga, applied for a patent to do something eerily similar. Two years later, Zynga was officially in the gambling business. And despite how creepy this is, I can still say wholeheartedly that gamification was the thing that helped me get sober. Using badges, milestones, rewards, progress bars, all of that sort of stuff. Stat checking? Man, that was an instrumental part of me quitting drugs and alcohol. And so now, while I'm researching this, the question that I keep asking is, how can you use this without it using you? I mean, sometimes the tactics are amazing and other times they're predatory. Given all of this, what do you do? I think you take the lead from Lizzie. The companies that use that predatory style of gamification, it's like they're playing the landlord's game. To win their game, they need the other players to lose. To lose their time, their money, even their happiness. But if there's one thing I've learned from Lizzie McGee, there are two ways to play this game. Now, big disclaimer, obviously I'm not an expert, just a dude with a YouTube channel and this is just what works for me, but here's how it goes in my head, so uh, follow along I guess. <laughs> I say it as three steps. Step one is spot the difference between the good and the bad. The difference, in my opinion, comes down to awareness. How much does somebody know that they are playing the game and what the game's boundaries are? To me, the moral value of gamification is proportional to its transparency. At the top here, we might have something like Duolingo. The boundaries of this gamification tool are known. It's like we enter an agreement with the owl to say, hey, I've got these little quirks in my brain and I will let you hijack them, but in exchange, you'll teach me Spanish. Awareness, good. But the less aware that the players are that they are even playing a game, the more it just becomes straight up manipulation. 
a pyramid scheme using levels, bad faith politics using competition, cults using roles and rules and objectives. These gamification tactics rely on low awareness and therefore low moral value, in my opinion. Step two is copy the throw, not the grenade. One good thing about bad gamification, like the Tinder Superlike, is that it's done really, really well. Awful ethics, but uh, cool execution. And this brings us back to Schrodinger's catch. Their throw is good. It's just the grenade I don't like. So step two is about taking the power back here, substituting that grenade with a tennis ball of your own. Outside of the metaphor, I am talking about copying game mechanics that have worked on you, but altering the thing that those game mechanics are trying to achieve. The Tinder super like was trying to get your money, but those same mechanics could, I don't know, make you swole, get you working out, do some push-ups or whatever. Probably. I'll use myself as an example here. So a game mechanic that has worked on me that has been a grenade is everything that they put onto auction websites. I really like secondhand junk. It's a vice. And the little game elements in auction websites really just ramp this up. The countdown timer. The demand for fast recalculations of risk. And the feeling of finding rare items. Those game elements have cost me money. Now I could call this my dumb decisions or I could call it their strategy. A strategy that I feel like I've got a right to use. Because those elements are neutral. They're just the arm that throws the thing. The grenade is the execution, the auction sites. So let's keep that throw and then substitute out the auction website for something in my life that I actually would like to do. Some hard things that I've been putting off that I know I should do. And let's flip the script. Emails. I hate writing emails, but if I put on a little countdown clock, I get them all done by the time it hits zero, because I am broken. Running, as you'll remember, is super boring. But trail running, when you gotta jump over like rocks and tree roots and stuff, that incorporates that demand for quick recalculation of risk. The feeling of finding rare items. I use this for writing. If I've got quite an intimidating thing that I need to write, I will procrastinate. But one way to offset this is to treat research like it's this item quest for obscure and interesting stories. I need to collect them and put them places. So these are all the exact same game mechanics that worked on me, but in a new context, they're working for me. That's the rough idea. And that brings us to step three do hard things. In this final step, and once again, this is just what works for me, here's what I've come up with. Firstly, abandon the hope that gamification will ever be some silver bullet that will magically make us motivated forever. Oh man. <laughs> Appropriately though, it is often this hope that makes us susceptible to other people's games. The hope that you can gamify love becomes Tinder's mechanic to gamify your money. And while the idea of abandoning hope might sound depressing, I actually think it's a really good grounds for something much more fulfilling. Experiencing the joy of doing hard things. There is one final story that I wanna leave you on, and it's kind of a beautiful story, and it's about a game, but it's so much more than that. Bennett Foddy, the Australian creator, he created a game called Getting Over It. The game is notoriously difficult. In it, you are a person who is stuck in a cauldron with a pickaxe, and it's your job to get to the top of a mountain. But the thing about Ben and Foddy is, he's not just a game designer, he's also a philosopher. On the surface, he wanted to annoy people, make them mad. But just like with Lizzie and the Landlords, Bennett also had a plan for that rage. The painful mechanics, the absence of a save function, and the taunting narration. To live is to suffer. To survive is to find some meaning in the suffering. Friedrich Nietzsche. It all just spelled out the simple truth. Hard things are rewarding things. You know that Jersey Gregory quote? Easy decisions, hard life, hard decisions, easy life. Bennett Foddy was basically saying, yeah, this game is ridiculously hard, even though it's so simple, but the rewards that you will feel every time that you get a little bit further are gonna be seismically bigger than the rewards you would feel if it didn't have that challenge. And this is just such a beautiful and elegant parallel, and one that I think is probably a good place to leave on. We started this video with a simple question. Can you make doing hard things fun? And instead of answering that question, Bennett Foddy hits us with another. Why would you want to? Life might not be easy, but Foddy is reminding us that easy isn't the point. Because easy is not often what people like about games either. There is no hack to getting over it. And this reminds us that, you know, sometimes there is no hack to motivation and we do just have to do things the hard way. Sometimes a task will just suck and a progress bar won't make that better. But it's here that he gives us that consolation. The harder that challenge is, the more it will actually level up your life.